Hey, what's up, blue team? So welcome back to another video on data integrity. We've covered a lot of ground so far. So if this is the first video that you're watching in this series, I highly recommend you go back and check out some of the other videos so that you're caught up until now. Up to now, we've had this entire series talking about data integrity, but we haven't actually discussed how you, well, keep your data intact on any given device, particularly in the form of preventing data corruption and bit rot. We briefly mentioned data corruption in the video on threats to your data and talked about how it can silently destroy a lot of your backups before you even realize it. But we didn't take the time to talk about how you can really prevent it, which is why we have this video to talk about it now. As you might remember, sometimes, for various reasons, when you copy a file from one place to another, it might not get copied correctly, which can result in your file being rendered unreadable. Today, at a high level, we're going to talk about the software tools that are designed to prevent data corruption and how they work. This video isn't really going to teach you the specifics of how to use and implement the software that we're going to discuss today, but rather focus on explaining how it works in the first place, why you might want to learn more about it, and equip you to do the research that you need to actually use one of these kind of software. As you may know by now, I'm really big talking about vocabulary before we talk about the actual details of what I want to discuss. The first thing that we're going to discuss here is what is a file system? I know most of us techies kind of intuitively know what a file system is, but it's actually very funny to me just how long it took me to come up with a good way to accurately explain what that word means in simple terms. In the broadest of terms, a file system is a set of instructions. This might be kind of a shitty analogy, but pull out a lined sheet of paper that you might write something on with a physical pencil. When you start writing a paragraph on it, how do you do it? Even though no one really told you to, you probably write the words on the lines rather than just randomly scribbling on the page like some kind of psychopath. And if those lines are spaced differently, you'll probably write your words following however the lines are spaced on the page. It's kind of a stretch to put it this way, but a file system is basically those lines on the page of your sheet of paper, but for your data and on your hard drive or CD or wherever you're storing your data. It's the instruction set that tells your computer how to write the ones and zeros it needs to save on whatever device you're using and be able to read them back in a way that is accessible and standardized for use by other computers. While at this really academic level of discussion, a file system is really just the set of instructions for your computer to use in storing files, in practice, every file system has its own low-level software that actually implements those instructions in a usable way. And you need the appropriate software installed on your computer in order to actually read or write data to any given file system. Damn, that was a lot of words to explain a concept that most IT people understand without even knowing that they understand it. Anyway, moving on. The next thing we need to talk about is the acronym RAID. RAID is an acronym that you may have heard thrown around before, and it stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. RAID is often associated with specific hardware or software implementations. My definition that I'm going to use in this video, on the other hand, is probably going to really trigger some of the more pedantic people watching this. But in our modern world, the most pragmatic way to define RAID is that it's a philosophy of how to store data. At a high level, the idea with RAID is that you take multiple disks, but pretend that they're all the same device. This can be implemented either at a software level or with specialized RAID hardware. The result of doing this is that your computer sees only one RAID device that it's gonna write a file to as if it were a single hard drive, but then through whatever RAID implementation you're using, that array of disks redundantly copies whatever data was sent to it between the RAID array and every single disk within it. So get it, it's a redundant array of independent disks. To be clear, that's really oversimplifying a lot of things of what RAID is, and there's a lot of ways to configure the specifics of how it's gonna work, what happens when a file is sent by your operating system to a RAID array and how it copies those to any disks that are in the array, what kind of disks you can stick in it, any array in any given configuration, but hold that thought for now. We'll, we'll get there a little bit. 
Another acronym that I wanted to mention, because it gets thrown around a lot when we're having discussions about RAID, is the acronym JBOD. JBOD stands for just a bunch of disks. JBOD refers to literally just plugging in a bunch of hard drives or disks or what, whatever you want to plug into your computer and using them as their own just the way you normally would without any sort of special software to orchestrate automatically copying stuff between the different devices. Again, to be clear for anyone who's going to be super pedantic about this, the term JBOD is also used a lot to refer to software RAID implementations that don't require any kind of specialized RAID hardware, but that's not how I'm going to be using the term JBOD for the purposes of this video. One last vocab word before I bore you to death. Let's discuss what a checksum value is. When you record a piece of data, you can run it through a mathematical formula that we call a checksum algorithm. The way that a checksum algorithm works is that for any given input, the algorithm will always return the same output. The use here is that after you run your data through a checksum algorithm, you can then record that output alongside your data. That way, when someone reads the data back, they can then put that data through the same checksum algorithm that you used when you wrote the data, and compare the result to the checksum value that was stored alongside with the data. If the algorithm outputs a different checksum value than the one that you originally recorded when you saved your data, you know that the data that you're looking at has been modified in some way or otherwise corrupted since it was recorded with that original checksum value. But you don't know what was changed, unfortunately. You just know that a change happened. Okay, now that I've bored you to death with vocabulary, let's finally loop back to the point that I wanted to make about keeping your data intact. The point I wanted to make is that certain RAID style architectures are a tool to help you fight silent data corruption. And let's explain that a little bit. So let's say that you have two copies of the same file on two separate hard drives. Let's say that one of those copies gets corrupted with a single bit in the file getting changed. If you used a checksum when you recorded that data, you could actually test both versions of the file and figure out which version was bad by comparing each version of your file to the checksum that you stored it with. Since you were smart enough to keep two copies of the file, you can then take the version of the file that the checksum told you was bad and replace it with the version that your checksum told you was good in order to fix whichever copy went bad. That sounds like a lot of work probably, and if you are using your disks in JBOD the way most people do, that is a lot of work. But what if I told you that there are file systems out there which do exactly what I just said automatically? There are file systems out there like BTRFS and ZFS, which are designed to implement a RAID style architecture across multiple disks in a way that when you tell your computer to save one copy of a file, your computer will automatically write multiple copies of that file to multiple different hard disks in your array, store the checksum value of each individual copy of that data, and then have the capacity to intelligently compare the checksum results of all of the files stored inside that array to automatically repair bad copies of your files using the duplicate good copies. That's awesome, right? I know I think it is. And I highly recommend that you use one of these checksumming file systems in order to store your data in an array of disks. But it gets even cooler than that. You know how I said that a file system is just a set of instructions? Well, that means that you can, in theory, actually use any file system that you want on any kind of device that you can think of. There's nothing really stopping you from turning a pair of CDs or a pair of USB drives or literally whatever you want into a RAID style array. In fact, I'd actually encourage you to do this with your backups. For example, when I make Blu-ray backups, I always make them in pairs. I use BTRFS to create an array across two Blu-ray disks so that all my backup data is duplicated across both disks. When I do it this way, I can mount just one of the disks if I lose the other one, just like in JBOD, and read it like a traditional CD drive with backup stored on it. But if I have both copies available at the same time, I can also use the tools provided by BTRFS to automatically compare the data on both disks and repair the broken data, if there is any broken data, with the copy from the other disk when I need to restore from my backup. So I'm almost guaranteed to not have any corrupted data, even if one of the two disks that I had in a backup pair had some files get corrupted on it. Pretty neat, huh? But let's get into some caveats. I know I just spent the last couple of minutes expanding on the virtues of RAID and how cool it can be, but not all RAID implementations are made equal. As I said before, 
Raid these days is more of a philosophy more than it is any single implementation of any one software. Not all raid implementations actually even do that checksumming process that I described to fix your data. That's actually really scary because when you write multiple copies of a file, that means that there's multiple chances for your file to get corrupted by being improperly to one of the disks it's being written to. That means that if a RAID implementation doesn't check some of your files and scrub them for errors, it's actually more likely to corrupt your data than just writing a single copy of your data to a single disk in traditional JBOD style. Just to give you an example of a tool that you should really avoid is a tool called MDADM, also known as Linux Software RAID. MDADM is a legacy tool that nobody really should be using anymore outside of ridiculously specialized contexts because it doesn't provide any tools for scrubbing your data for data corruption. MDADM will fuck up your data and you will cry. So don't use it and ignore any boomer that tells you to use it anyway. But really, that's just one example. I'm sure that there's other tools out there that I don't know about that are similarly misleading and may not adequately implement measures to protect your data despite copying them to multiple different devices automatically. Just because it says RAID on the tin and it says that it mirrors your data does not mean that that tool is any good for protecting your data. Do your research before picking any particular RAID implementation and make sure that it's right for you and right for your data. If you asked me personally what to use, I would probably steer you toward either BTRFS or ZFS as your RAID tool of choice, since both of those are the industry standard for this kind of thing. I would also advise you to ignore anyone who tells you to buy hardware-based RAID. Not only is RAID hardware really expensive and specialized, but it introduces a single point of failure because if your hardware RAID controller dies, then your entire data pool is fucked. Hardware-based RAID is a relic of the past from when computers were way less powerful and software-based RAID was not nearly as mature and robust as it is today. You can run file systems like BTRFS or ZFS on any normal consumer grade computer without having any special hardware of any kind and it'll protect your personal data in a way that's more than adequate. There's also another important hardware-related caveat that needs to be said when it comes to RAID and checksumming file systems. Even though you can technically use a checksumming file system on any hardware you want, I would advise that if you have an array that is built out of hard disk drives specifically, that you're actively using and isn't just sitting unplugged, that you make sure to use hard drives that are not built with shingled magnetic recording or SMR technology. Shingled magnetic recording is a technology that was designed for normal consumer use, which primarily is going to be accessing random files at random times. If you have a use case that involves quickly reading through the contents of a drive from the beginning to finish in sequential order, which is exactly what you need to do when you're scrubbing your data for errors with a checksumming file system, that shingled magnetic recording drive will slow down to a crawl. Your error scrubs will run on an SMR hard drive, but they will take excessively long. And when I say excessive, I, I mean it, like three or four times as long as a traditional CMR hard drive of the same size. As such, make sure that any hard drives that you're purchasing with the specific intent of being used in a file storage array do not use SMR as their recording technology. SMR is a cost-cutting technology that not a lot of consumers know much about, so manufacturers are often very sketchy and don't properly disclose whether hard drives they sell will use it or not, since its drawbacks are only really visible to weirdos like us us who put our disks into checksumming file system arrays. Pay close attention and do your research when buying new hard drives for this purpose. And that, my fellow blue team, is how you keep your backups clean and protect them from data corruption. But let's be clear about one thing. Last time, we talked about the 3210 rule and why it's so important to keep multiple copies of your data so that you can restore from the extra copies as a backup. Now, for our purposes, the extra copies of your data that reside within your RAID array for checksumming purposes are not and should not be considered a backup copy in terms of the 3210 rule. They protect your data from being corrupted by random bit flips and nothing more. If you get ransomware, or even if your operating system has an error and decides to tell your RAID array to overwrite a file with bad data, both copies in your array will be destroyed concurrently. I told you earlier that you should consider making your backups in linked pairs via BTRFS or ZFS RAID, but just remember that when you do that, you should consider the device pair to be a single copy for the purpose of the 3210 rule, rather than an individual device being its own copy. Just like the RAID thinks of itself as one block device, you should think of the RAID as one device.
I'll actually go a step further on this even. If you use a cloud desktop utility like Dropbox or OneDrive that syncs your data from your computer to the cloud in real time, you'll run into this exact same issue as you do with a RAID and real-time destruction in both places from bad file overwrites. When you use a real-time sync tool, you're effectively removing the separation between two copies of data and making them effectively the same singular copy for the purposes of the 3210 rule. That's not to say that you're completely wrong for using a real-time cloud sync tool like that. It might protect your data if your computer's destroyed in a fire or stolen or something like that, but just be aware of the limitations that you're imposing on yourself and always keep spare copies of your data that are not being modified in real time as you work with your files on your primary computer. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I might do an actual video on how BTRFS is used sometimes since it's my checksumming file system of choice. But for now, I'll link the getting started guide below so that you can read on the BTRFS wiki how to use it if you're interested. It only works on Linux and Unix systems. So if you want something for Windows, you're, you're kind of out of luck. But Windows file storage just sucks ass and I don't recommend using it anyway. I'll also link some resources to do with ZFS since it's another really common tool that's used for the same purpose. I also wanted to link a super neat article discussing how to choose your RAID architecture and advocating for the use of RAID 10 style device mirroring over the RAID 5 or RAID 6 style striped data parity. But that article is so concise and well written that if I made a video on it, I'd basically just be reading it off word for word. So I'm going to link it below and you can read it yourself if that's something that you find interesting. But I hope that you learned something here, and if you prefer a different checksumming file system tool or have a different way of protecting yourself from data corruption than I mentioned here, be sure to leave a comment below. Anyway, thanks everyone. Bye.